Greetings, everyone, and welcome once again to the Our World Media Network. I'm your host, Wayne Gilman, for the show Urban Algorithm. We had our first show last week, and I just want to thank everybody for uh, at least checking in. I had no publicity, and I'm humbled that we had such a huge response. Uh, I'm back after a long absence. I'm somewhat semi-retired at this point, but those of you in the New York metropolitan area who are familiar with my work, years ago on WBLS, WLIB, Air America, 1010 Winds, and RL, WWRL. Well, this is who I am. I'm glad to be back. And again, uh, we're doing something new with this uh, brand new network called the Our World Media Network. And um, the second edition for this Urban Algorithm on June 19th, 2021. Today, obviously, is Juneteenth a day that many of us in our community are certainly celebrating. And uh, it's a day, historically speaking, uh, that slaves were informed two years after the fact that they were free in 1865, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's just amazing what is going on that we were able to, to garner a second holiday. Of course, we have King Day. And it just seems like all of a sudden this happened. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just interesting that we're just now within this past year that a lot of us are finding out our history. I first ran across Juneteenth while working 20 years ago uh, at the station. Uh, one of the owners, uh, Chuck Sutton, who was a big executive at Inner City Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, the Sutton family, the owners, the principal owners of the station, they came from Texas. And one day we got into a discussion about Juneteenth, and I'd never heard about it. And uh, I credit Chuck for at, at least light, igniting the flame to at least getting the word out. And we were uh, basically doing shows on the importance of that day uh, over the years. And, um, you know, here we are now with a federal holiday and uh, hopefully will not become as commercialized as King Day has been. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things. So we'll just have to see what's going on, because as far as I'm concerned, slavery is not over, not when you have issues with the educational system, where critical race thinking is not being discussed, when you have voter suppression in various parts of the states, when the Republican Party is not even re not even doing anything to maintain a democracy in this country. And uh, I could go on and on, and in fact, I will. For this first 30 minutes, we have a very, very special guest, someone who I've uh, worked with back in the day. He's got better broadcast credentials than I do, I'd like to think. Uh, we want to welcome to the show this afternoon, Mr. Reggie Thomas. Reginald Thomas, the broadcast executive. Reggie, welcome. Did I leave anything out? Thank How you, you doing, thank you, man? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you left out the fact that my broadcast credentials are not as strong as yours. Oh, please. You got it going on. So, uh, I, But I appreciate uh, you having me on today. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot that's going on and, and, and needs to be discussed and uh, so, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, one thing I've, you know, apart from our friendship, um, the one thing that I've been basically inspired by you is our discussions on cultural events, topical issues uh, over the years. I mean, even when you were sales director at WLIB, you were a very strong advocate for keeping the talk programming on the station, which had a, uh, as far as I'm concerned, had a pivotal impact on the community, you know, in terms of motivating people, starting businesses. And, um, you know, it, it, it was just such a breath of fresh air, considering when you juxtapose that level of programming with what was going on in music radio at the time. And as we fast forward, of course, social media has had its impact now, and it's uh, an entirely different ball game. Uh, in fact, I was against social media. I decided like 10, 12 years ago, let me, after 35 years on the air in the traditional sense, let me bow out of this. 
but I see the benefits of it, and I, I you know, we have a completely new crop of uh, broadcasters now, and I'd like to think to a certain extent what we did back then has paved the way for what we're going through now in terms of people being employed. The more faces that look like us in front of the uh, camera, in front of the microphones. I, I go back to a time when uh, the broadcast industry, particularly the networks, it was like Noah's Ark. They would only have like two of us and two Latinos and two other uh, people of color that they figured that fit the profile of having some sort of integrated system there. And a lot of us are talented and, and it, it just take took, I should say, having uh, an independent operation to have these things uh, fall into place the way they have. But um, getting back to what's going on politically, um, I, I guess we could begin with uh, Juneteenth. What's the uh, response where you are in Florida? Well, you see, let me, let me kind of like start from the beginning. Um, the response to Juneteenth in Florida is... is um, you know, when you watch the local uh, news and the local programming, uh, there has been attention to Juneteenth. But I'm going to tell you the God's honest truth. Growing up in New York City schools, uh, Juneteenth wasn't taught. Exactly. I had never heard of Juneteenth until I moved to Houston. And when I lived in Houston, I was the uh, I was the general manager of um, Radio Disney. Uh, in Houston, and uh, it was a Disney-owned station, and I had a friend uh, there who was a promoter, the late Ken Kenneth uh, Austin, and Ken asked me about Juneteenth promotion. This was in 1999, mm. and I asked him, what, "What are you talking about, Juneteenth?" And he explained what it was, and I was so shocked that. This wasn't taught in a school. And this, this speaks to what we're talking about when it comes to critical race theory. There's so much. And you, and you figure in a school system the size of New York. Well, I guess, you know, in New York, you can't be, you can't be surprised that that's not something that's taught. In answer to your question, though, just to start there, uh, here in the Central Florida area, uh, there is a, uh, a uh, an attention being paid to Juneteenth. Uh, there were uh, uh, celebrations, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in Orlando and in Daytona Beach, and they had a little parade, uh, and uh, the kids were involved. And and um, you know, last night, uh, if I don't know if you saw it, but uh, ABC did a uh, a Juneteenth celebration with uh, uh, President Obama, uh, and it was hosted by uh, the young man that was in Hamilton. I forgot his name just that quick. Oh, uh, um, Manuel Luis Miranda, I believe. I think that's... No, 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 not, not Manuel. Uh oh The the, uh, the, the brother uh, oh. that sings. Right, right. I can't think of his yeah, name. I, I know who you're talking about. about. Yeah. That's Odom? It escapes me. Yeah, a minute. But, right. But Juneteenth is... Uh, you know that the the uh, uh, the, uh, the people who uh, weren't working today, some of your African American uh, local anchors were off today, and uh, you know this being their first uh, 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 Juneteenth activity day, um, people are taking full advantage of it. Yeah, and I, I find that up here. I mean, uh, and I'm not familiar exactly with where you are in Florida. And when I look at Florida, I, I think of it as being the epicenter of Republican politics. I mean, you have a uh, a governor who I feel that wants to turn the clock back. Uh, you uh, have a resident, uh, our former president, President Clorox, who's living in the area there. And uh, I'm sorry. I mean, a, a lot of the things. you guys now. He's up in Jersey right now. Is he really? Okay, I didn't even. I don't oh, follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He left a couple of weeks ago. I don't follow the man's itinerary. I I just think that uh, to a great extent he has uh, a lot of issues that he's trying to see because he was able to wiggle his way out of the impeachment process. 
Um, right now, we're going to see whether or not if this January 6th insurrection is going to stick to his uh his his uh, history, you know, in terms of swaying the vote. But there's so much foolishness going on out there in terms of misinformation, especially coming from conservative media. And and that is largely the problem. I, I, I would like to think that if there is a chance to, to maintain the power that the Biden administration has already you know, has uh, basically taken control of since Election Day, that uh, we won't have uh, to worry about what's going on with the other side. But it's it's the voting populace in this country, as far as I'm concerned, there's a, there's a level of ignorance that, um, first of all, there's a lot of misinformation, as we pointed out to in the beginning, in terms of uh, thinking, critical thinking, race thinking, and then uh, you have an electorate out there that's just totally uninformed or misinformed. And they follow whatever traditions they've been known to follow until they've been directly affected. And so therefore, um, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that the, uh, the landscape in Florida is going to change. What do you think? Well, you know, um, here's, here's what we're facing. Uh, there are approximately... Uh, a thousand people that move to Florida every day. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how many people pass away in Florida every day. Because, you know, uh, old (laughs) joke is that... Well, the the old joke is that Florida is uh, death's waiting room. Uh, (laughs) But but when you look at the fact that... uh, so much of it is dedicated to Disney and Universal, Bush Gardens, Miami is a big uh, financial uh, uh, center in this uh, this country. A lot of people are leaving the New York area and coming to Florida. Uh, this this, uh, this pandemic uh, gave people an opportunity to reassess uh, what their lives are looking like. And um, and uh, as a result, uh, if you I don't know if you remember when you saw all the moving vans in New York where people were moving out of their apartments. So they were moving out of state. They're moving upstate. They're moving mm-hmm. because the the lockdown in the apartments really freaked people out. And Florida never had a mass mandate. Florida never uh, certain county counties had, had mass mandates. You know that uh, Jerry Demings, who is uh, Congresswoman uh, Val Demings' husband, is the mayor of Orange County, which uh, also consists of Orlando. Uh, he had a mass mandate, but he was going round and round with DeSantis because DeSantis didn't want any uh, mandates whatsoever. Uh, you said that you weren't sure where we were. I'm, I'm, I personally am about 25 miles outside of Orlando, but I'm also very close to a community called the Villages. Right, and And notoriously um, known, I buy that. Yeah, that was the the community where you saw the news where the the Caucasian gentleman was in his uh, golf cart and he screamed with his fist in the air, white power. And, uh, you know, uh, the Villages community was very, very embarrassed about that now the developers are trump and DeSantis supporters so they are very much in tune with uh you know what is going on in terms of uh you know what what's going on in terms of the republicans activities Mm -hmm. you know uh but there are a lot of residents there who are moving into the state who um may have not been republicans or were republicans and saw the shenanigans and said, you know what, I can't, I can't uh, subscribe to that, and and changed party affiliation or just changed their voting um, habit uh, to something different. Uh, so, um, so g- going back to what I was saying, you got a thousand people coming into Florida every day, mm-hmm. moving into Florida. Uh, I can't believe that there's not 
uh, a certain percentage of those people who are uh, are not Republican or who uh, don't subscribe to what they see is taking place in the Republican Party. So and, there's there's hope. Well, I'd like to think so. I mean, the thing is, you've had some squeakers uh, in terms of the gubernatorial contest a couple of years ago. And, um, and again, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that Val Dennings, as she uh, tries to put in a bid for a Senate seat and uh, remove uh, our Latino friend in the uh, Southern, would that be the same county or is that, because uh, I, I think oh, he's, Rubio he's more, represents. Yes, Rubio is, is more south. Right, right. Yeah, he's, and, he's, and, he's further south. But so, so in other words, basically his, his constituency base is in the south. And I could never right, but, understand. But Val Deming, go ahead, go ahead. She's from the north, though. She's from the. She's from. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Val Deming is from Alachua County, uh, Gainesville area. Oh, okay, right. But it just yeah, seems like the, the north. It, it just seems like his base is like Miami, um, Palm Palm uh, Beach. Brown Beach, uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, all the, and I and I don't and, get it because there's a huge uh, uh, populace of people from the Caribbean, not just Latinos, but people of color, who seem to buy into some of the things that he's been espousing. Largely, the the largely the Latino community, Cuban. Uh, Particularly, mm -hmm. are, uh, are are big supporters of uh, Trump, um, Rubio, uh, the Republican base. That that uh, has um, been very very surprising to me, especially being that uh, typically the former president, if you weren't of his. Uh, of his caliber, of his taste, he could care less about you. And so I, I never understood why people who are minorities in this uh, state uh, felt as though that he was someone suitable that they should support. Well, I, I think the, I the problem, the, you know, I, I can tell you, I, I really think the problem with him and what has gone on with the uh, the rest of the country, they're not familiar with his history here in New York. You know, we, we had a reporter, I uh, invoked the memory of the late Wayne Barrett, who uh, used to write for the Village Voice, he constantly did articles on Donald Trump and his family and you know, what's gone on with them, with his positions on race and things of that nature. You know, we lost his voice uh, just before uh, Donald uh, Trump became president. I think in 2016 or 2017, um, Wayne Barrett passed. But the deal is, is that Trump was smart enough to uh, basically enhance his, his global image with the TV shows so therefore, since you have such an ignorant American voting populace and they just go along with what they see as opposed to really, I, mean, I, I shouldn't paint with a broad stroke. There are people like you, and I'd like to think me, even though my mind isn't what it used to be, <laughs> I'd like to think that there are people who are sharp enough to understand and decipher, you know, the rhetoric from the truth. And um, and again, you, I mean, you've been around the country working for different markets and and, you know, uh, I, I have this issue with 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 uh, conservative media. I, I have a problem. The fact that uh, we no longer have a fairness doctrine in which there is an obligation to present sides that basically leave the viewers and the listeners an opportunity to evaluate what's going on. What's your take on that? Well, you know, first thing, you know, you give too much credit to Donald Trump. Uh, number one, I really believe the only reason why he became president was because so many of the young people uh, who were supporting Bernie Sanders uh, were unhappy about the fact that he was not the nominee. 
They wanted him to be the nominee and not Hillary. So the inference was that Hillary was going to win anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't need to vote for her. And then, of course, uh, uh, the Donald got in. Uh, and we saw what that was all about. That right. was that was an egregious four years. Oh yeah. And uh, oh, that was no, that was that was that was for real. And uh, it was couldn't and, even and sleep I, the last well, year. Of it. You know, and you know, and and I've been, you know, you 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 and I've known each other uh, close to uh, thirty years, mm -hmm. and uh, you also know that. I'm one of the few African American media people that has lived in Russia. Right. Uh, so the thing is, is that uh, you know, uh, you know, our former president, people just believed that he uh, was, you know, just really sweet on uh, Putin. Trust me, that was not the case. Uh, Putin is a former KGB agent. Mm -hmm. And when I lived in Russia, Putin was not on the radar. Uh, Yeltsin was the president at that time. Uh, Bill Clinton came to Moscow and Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin had wonderful uh, relationship. The relationship between the United States and Russia wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of businesses that were going into Russia to do, uh, you know, to open up new uh, opportunities. Uh, Putin didn't like that. Putin wants to be a, um, uh, you know, to have his own uh, kingdom. Well, and I honestly believe that our former president was compromised. Uh, you you got to remember None of our former presidents operated in the Russian space in a business, uh, at a business level, except the last former president. And he did that with the Miss Universe uh, pageant. And you know what his weakness is with women. And, and, and a former KGB uh, president would put you in a situation where he'd have hidden cameras and and uh and recordings to be able to uh to to put you in a situation where you would be holding to him and and that is my take on it the thing is is that don't give so much credit to him he's not a genius he's not that you know, that smart is just a matter of the fact that the stars aligned where people didn't vote the way they were supposed to. And I hope we never, ever, ever do that again. Because what unleashed was a Pandora's box uh, that consists of voter suppression and cheating and scandals. And over the next Oh, next, next few years, you're going to hear about the craziest things that have gone on. You've heard about reporters. You think about that. You're a reporter that does your job, and you have a president who's able to use the Department of Justice to investigate right. information, private information. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were opening up information on children's phones. Mm -hmm. children's phone man when you think about that stuff that's the reason why that commercial runs on tv reminding people to support the free press because in a in an autocratic society or a society where you have a um an individual like a putin well he's an autocrat but he's also what you call a kleptocrat and um, and I really believe that uh, Donald Trump would have become that. Oh, a without question. Steals from their uh, their uh, their their government. Uh, 
so you know the thing is, is don't give him that much credit i'm glad he's out uh and then you still have your 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 uh superior obstructors the mcconnell's i believe joe manchin is an obstructor i did believe me he is responding to someone or some group that's very very powerful well you know i'm glad you brought that and up i heard last week it was the Koch yeah, brothers the Koch brothers is right. who they pointed to but it could be other people too well, it's funny because West Virginia is a very interesting state. I always got the impression that that was like, you know, an unchangeable red state that, you know, there was a certain culture, a certain work ethic, you know, amongst the miners that they, they a tradition that would not change no matter, they would not be open to anything and, and, and that's it. And it took a demonstration by uh, Reverend William Barber uh, especially over this whole issue with Joe Manchin and, and the filibuster that basically exposed that not everybody in that state is in lockstep with what Manchin is thinking. So obviously there's a hidden agenda. And of course, he's come up with something now, and I'm not really quite sure what he hopes to uh, uh, gather by that. But um, there, there, there's this uh, belief that maybe he... It as much wants to maintain the filibuster is open to some sort of change. Uh, enough that Stacey Abrams seems to uh, have supported whatever movement that he's uh, he's swinging in in this in in, in that direction. Um, I I don't I still don't get it, and I don't understand why the Democratic leadership has not done enough to basically reel him in as I feel that the Democratic leadership should do more to reel in voters in Florida. Well, you know, one of the things that you got to give um, credence to is that Joe Biden has been in Washington in some form or fashion for almost 50 years. And as frustrated as I get sometimes with uh, his uh, his approach uh, to be um, more sullen. I have to remember that he is very skilled in terms of creating friendships through uh, through the uh, Washington area on both sides of the aisle. Now McConnell is uh, trying to. Uh, uh, appease Trump and his base mm. and whomever is behind the scenes there. Uh, one of the things that why Manchin is so important is because the margin is so close on the vote, but in the Senate. Uh, and, and, uh, and as you know, it's 50-50. Um, and then when Kamala Harris votes, she throws it over. Uh, without Manchin, uh, you know, we're back at square A. Uh, one of the things that really, really concerns me is this voter, uh, this voting rights issue. Uh, you and I talked about this the other day, and I told you that I've been a Florida voter for probably about 16 years. And in this last election uh, in 2020, uh, I got a call. I voted by ballot. And I got a call that um, that my uh, there was a question about my signature. Reggie, at that point, that if vote... if you could just hold on for a hot second, we got to Go take on. a break here. Thirty minutes have okay. gone by already. This is the Urban Algorithm on the Hour Media World Media Network. Forgive me. We'll be back in a minute. And stick a pin in that. I want to hear that. And also, we have a very special guest coming on, the publisher of the Carib News, Carl Rodney. So he'll be joining you if you have the moment to stay. Right back after this. And every day is a challenge to make sure that the time that I have, I spend with them. It doesn't matter how tired you are. You have to try to teach them 
when they learn something new and you can just see in their faces. It's, it's such an incredible moment. It's those moments that are, that are my favorite. I feel like mental health for me is a thing that doesn't really get talked about. It's harder for us to express our feelings because we're, we're taught young to uh, bottle them up. My name is Tobey Chuku Dubem Wigwe. I'm an Igbo boy from the southwest side of Houston, Texas, and I'm here to talk with Muhammad and Jordan uh, about emotions, feelings, mental health. And you know what I'm saying? We're just gonna let the spirit move. I'm Jordan, I'm 12 years old. I'm Muhammad. This is my stepson. Um, I just call him my son. As a father, it's your responsibility to lead your children into being mentally healthy, yeah. emotionally healthy. Sometimes when I cry, I won't know how um, how I'm feeling or why I'm crying. I just grew up never feeling like it was OK to cry. And so he really forced me to have to reconnect with the kid that didn't get to cry. That's beautiful. In the society that we were, we were brought up in, uh, it's very hard on little black boys. So you have to navigate feelings and emotions so the world don't get you. We had to Yo le cuento casi todo a mi mamá. Yo la entendería. En mi escuela, los papás los dejan hacer todo. Mis padres son estrictos y me quieren proteger. Puedo uh, entender eso completamente. Bailando entre dos vidas. El pasado. As they head toward the finish, Warren has built a substantial lead and headed for her fourth gold medal. She's ahead of the world record pace by at least half a second, and she... Oh, wait, wait, what's she doing? She... I think she's doing a headstand. Why would she do that? She's stopping. She just, she stopped. I've never seen she, she was so close like to the this. finish, and she stopped. I, mean, this I don't is, know what this she's is thinking. unbelievable. Yeah, I've never... 33 minutes past the hour. This is the Our World Media Network. You are listening to The Urban Algorithm. I'm your host, Wayne Gilman. And uh, I am so pleased to have two very good friends with us. We're expecting a, a third guest. But uh, I just want to bring into the uh, conversation uh, the publisher, veteran uh, journalist, the publisher of the Cab News, Mr. Carl B. Rodney. Mr. Rodney, I understand you're standing by. Welcome. Can you hear? It's such a pleasure to be with you. And it's, uh, uh, we've had such a long and productive association. And may I say friendship. I, I mean, I, I, a, 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 a class journalist. And I'm so happy that we have you back in our midst uh, doing what you do so well. Thank you very much. And, and, and I really am honored that you would come at the last minute. And of course, I, you know, Mr. Reginald Thomas he used to be with us back in the day at WLIB uh, as the exec, uh, sales exec Good for the you. station. Reggie. Yeah. Good to see can, you too. Great. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure the technology is working properly. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I don't know, Carl, if you had an opportunity to hear what we were talking about a moment ago, but uh, Reggie was explaining mm -hmm. how difficult it was for him to vote in the last presidential election. And um, we have a huge Caribbean populace in Florida. And, and as soon as he finishes his story, I want you to give me your thoughts and your reaction to what has gone on. Well, uh, you know, what we're faced with is a, an organized nationwide attempt to uh, disenfranchise a large group black and brown people. It seems to be the official policy of the Republican Party. And um, it is something that threatens the very 
core of this country, the democracy. And yes, we in um, Florida, we saw a row, uh, and the numbers escape me now, but we were looking at um, somewhere in the neighborhood of almost 700,000 Caribbean voters between Jamaicans, Haitians, and other country Trinidadians. And it would be a, a vote that would be solidly in the Democratic Party generally, but with um, the uh, Biden-Harris ticket, uh, there was lots of excitement. And, uh, and so we were even touched with the Biden-Harris camp and uh, about making the extra effort in Florida around the Caribbean um, uh, population. Same thing was, was in Georgia and uh, to some extent, Texas with Houston. So um, we had pinpoint for that um, campaign areas where we felt the Caribbean American voters would be of consequence and should be um, targeted. And so they did. And so we were a little bit dis disappointed when Trump was able to take Florida. Um, and uh, we, again, uh, have to look at the campaign and the program, you know, actual program that exists within the Republican Party to disenfranchise the voters. So we, we as a community, and of course, we're all part of the black and brown community, we, we come together around that. But just in terms of the calculation and the appeal and push in our Caribbean American community in Florida, we thought um, we would have seen a stronger result. So clearly there was an effort there to, to um, suppress the vote in those black and brown areas, which the Caribbean community was a part of. So I call just the end of, of, of the discussion, but absolutely agree in terms of what our experience have been and uh, just what the, the news reports have been. Well, well, the one thing that I'm and I'm so glad that Reggie's still standing by. Um, I I think that media played a large role in the vote process with respect to advertising. I know Bloomberg had sent a lot of money to the Florida market, and you, as a publisher, and and basically the gold standard for all Caribbean publishing, as far as I'm, you've been around. What almost forty years now, or or has it been yeah. longer? <laughs> I can't years, tell no, from yeah, yeah. I can't tell from your youthful appearance, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I can tell from my gray hair. But Reggie, one thing I want, if you have a minute, to just recount how that money was spent in the uh, in the media markets, and maybe uh, there might be some correlation between what you've observed and what Carl probably was able to witness from his vantage point. Well, one of the things that I saw, and you know, I've not only worked in radio and print, but I also worked in television. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg earmarked a hundred million dollars for uh, President Biden uh, and the Biden-Harris team uh, to uh, target Florida. Uh, one of the things that I saw here in Central Florida uh, was a usurping of the uh, expenditures and the placement of those ads. And, and I, I am saying it, and I know that it can be proven. And the reason is, is because radio station logs as well as television station logs are federal documents. They have used logs to capture murderers someone who has murdered another uh, an individual, they were able to use station logs to cap capture that person because maybe they lied and they said something took place that actually didn't. Mm. Uh, whenever President, whenever the Biden team ads ran uh, and on many of the stations, an anti-Biden or Trump ad ran usually within the same break. And there's supposed to be 15 minute separation between ads. Sometimes you can't do quite 15 minutes, but they shouldn't run directly behind that. 
And I did whatever I could to reach out to the Biden team. I reached out to Joe Biden through Twitter. I reached, I called Kamala Harris's office in San Francisco. I called April Ryan. I called Simone Sanders. Uh, I called uh, uh, Cornell William Brooks, uh, the former president of NAACP. The only person who I got a response from was Reverend William Barber. And mm -hmm. I was so angry, I told my wife, don't send another dime to the campaign <laughs> until we get this straight. Because it was way too much money that was being wasted. And one of the things that I hope to do in the next few weeks is speak with uh, Congresswoman Demings and her team about making sure that they don't allow their money to go to waste. Because I honestly believe that some of the TV companies here in Central Florida and probably all over Florida uh, have uh, Republican underpinnings. Uh, and, you know, just kind of like very nebulously, uh, you know, uh, make sure that these, uh, these spots not run the way they're supposed to. Uh, I was really, really disappointed in that because what I thought should have happened with the Biden team is they put the brakes on the ad spending, sit down and meet with all the TV stations and say, hey, listen, we're hearing that there's shenanigans going on with this ad campaign. If you aren't able to make sure that our, run, our spots run fairly, that we could pull the money and move and put it somewhere else. And Carl, so you got to be very, very careful because of the the amount of money that goes into running these campaigns. Carl Rodney, your observations about what Reggie just explained, because I was astounded when I first heard it. Now, Reggie's right on 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 spot, and um, and Reggie, it goes to um, not only the placement or the positioning but it goes to the entire placement and the entire approach to um, advertising in black, uh, black uh, paper and black media and, and black um, radio and TV. Um, I'm on the board of the uh, NNPA, which is the National Newspaper Publishers Association. And of course, we have been back battling for a long time around political ads. You know, they depend on our community to turn out the votes, to depend on our community, to do all the things, the magics that they want, but they're not spending the money in the black media and black traditional uh, and black owned media. And so um, that has been the struggle. The Bluebird people, to their credit, um, early on actually allocated a substantial budget to black and black owned media. And uh, we saw that. And in fact, most of the and NPA members, which you know, total about two hundred across the nation, um, were able to participate in, in in that buy, but that's unusual when it comes to uh, political buys within the black and black owned media, and so it's a it, Reggie, it's a battle that we we are fighting on several fronts, not not only because of what it means to black owned media and black owned business and trusted media and truth and where we are but also to the old concept of where we are as a people and how we need to be treated and looked upon, particularly when we put out so much as um, in our numbers and see very little in the way of business recognition and advertising to uh, match what we do uh, in, in the various fields. So uh, we are looking at your placement and, and our runs, but we're also very keen, and we, we, we just had a battle here in New York as to looking at uh, 50, 50, 57, 58 percent of the voters who are black and, and, and brown, and then you look at one percent of their advertising budget coming to black owned media. So it's, it's a battle that we all have to be uh, in, and it's a battle of really trusted, having our people respected, and, and certainly in the future of how we operate in communication as a, as a people. 
And that's something I don't quite understand. I've been away from this for about 10, 12 years. I, I, I saw things that were going on uh, back in the early, uh, let's say, uh, the, the last, not the last decade so much, but I guess uh, even before we had the turn of the century, that there was... Uh, social media was already beginning to have its impact. I mean, it was having its impact on TV. It certainly uh, had a colossal impact on print media. But, you know, the bottom line, which you just raised a moment ago, is that the viewership, the people who uh, view and read uh, the publications, a lot of us, a lot of them are people who look like us, black and brown people. And yet when it comes to advertising, you know, there doesn't seem to be a correlation even to this day just based on what you're saying, Carl Rodney, that, um, you know, you're not getting your fair share. And, and, and this is part of the process to, to stifle, you know, information. Right. right. Stifle you know? information and kill a communication network because without the voice, you won't be heard. And without your authentic voice, you'll never hear the truth. And uh, as we are um, looked upon, ignored, and, um, and, and in fact punished as, as a black business and in the communication business, it presents a tremendous challenge as to how, who will tell our stories, who will um, protect our legacy, and who will in fact determine where we are as a community. And um, it is a issue that we have been at it but even with the racial reckoning that is taking place in the country and we have documented uh, from a consumer consumption standpoint how black and brown people consume and how they are they're they're trend in in their purchase but you're still not getting that recognition or that e equity or, uh, you know, the disparity is still very wide with respect to how you get revenue and how you can organize your business. Uh, and when, and Reggie and you notice that uh, black and black owned media is probably the most trusted source of news in this country exactly. because they understand where we're coming from and they understand authenticity. So there's no question, you know, with the social media noise, there's going to be a lot of noise and a lot of, um, issues that really has no real source or or um, truth to back it up. It's just noise. People are making all kinds of claims and, and, and you know, social media is fine. But when it comes to real journalism, when it comes to reporting, I'm looking at people like you and Richie. I'm looking at folks we dealt with all the years that are committed to serious and uh, consistent journalism very serious and and that's where we have black owned media uh, as a leg up but it's not recognized and it's not supported and um I, you know I, I don't mean to to go off um on on this particular issue but it's one of the moment it's one that we are uh, working on and working to resolve because we don't want to be without a voice and become even more irrelevant as people determine what they want to do in this country. Well, I happen to agree with you on that. I, and it's unfortunate because, you know, I, I, I just working in media alone, sometimes it, it's just a, a toss up as to what could happen. You know, I always felt that uh, journalism to, to have a career in that you had to take a vow of poverty. <laughs> and I certainly, you know, <laughs> tried to, you know, it's my the Catholic in me. But uh, the deal is, is that it, it, it really comes down to that. But the money's there, you know, and there's no reason why you know, as a publisher of, of of Carib News, you couldn't get your fair share. Reggie, same thing applied to you when, you know, when you were with us, uh, and I'm saying us, but I'm no longer a part of that. I'm semi-retired. But, you know, it, it was just like one of the f arguments that I couldn't seem to understand why people just did not want to support. And now, with Juneteenth here, a federal holiday, you know, I'd like to think that the dynamics will change. What do you think? Well, let me, that's kind of like, let's go back a little bit. I've worked at not only WLIB as, as the uh, 
as the uh, general sales manager, but I also was the general sales manager at KJLH, which is Stevie Wonder Station. Stevie Wonder. Mm-hmm. Uh, I worked at V103, and I also ran Metro Media uh, and, and Infinity Broadcasting. I was the uh, director of sales at one of their stations in Baltimore. And then, of course, as you know, the director of sales at the Crisis Magazine. Right. Uh, the experience as a manager in black media is that uh, white uh, media, which is considered general market, uh, does not value black consumers like they con- like they value white consumers, except in certain key categories, things like sneakers uh and um and and uh you know uh sportswear and clothing in some elements um uh one of the biggest areas which i found was was egregious was uh um title loans Mm. uh where you had companies who were making a thousand percent sometimes 2,400% interest rate on title loans. Uh, As a matter of fact, title loans became so egregious that some states had to regulate uh, the advertising and the the, uh, usury laws as it related to title loans. Um, One of the things that we need to... I hate to interrupt, but maybe you could give us a, a, a thumbnail explanation about title loans, you know, and, and how so that you applies. own a car. Right. You you own a car outright. And you need some money. You can't get any money from the bank. So what you do is you use the title to your car as, as equity. collateral. Collateral. A, mm-hmm. a, as for a loan. That's correct. And sometimes the usury rate steak is the, the interest rate on that was as much as 1,700, 2,000%. What? It was ridiculous. Are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> and I, and I no, think this, and, and I think for the usury rate, the, 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 the highest could be no more than what, 15, 16%? But with, I, with title maybe, loans, they were ridiculous. And, 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 the, uh, and, and government had to step in and state at, at the state level and, and really, uh, it'll put uh, regulation in how that uh, was, uh, how, how the state regulated the use of that. Um, so the thing is, is that one of the things that we have to be very, very careful of, you got to first thing, pay attention to companies who uh, appear not to value you as a consumer. Uh, I saw it in every black organization or every organization that targeted black consumers. Hmm. If you look at black radio, you will see that very rarely you get banking business. You, you, the investment industry does not uh, 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 look at black consumers as a key, as a key consumer. Hmm. Um, one of the things that happen in automotive is that car dealerships and and um, and and uh, and the like were charging black consumers more money on interest rates than uh, they were charging other ethnic groups. So, in answer to that, and I know we're running short on time, we have to be very very careful as consumers. Don't just run and spend your money with. Uh, with certain organizations and certain companies because everybody is not trying to be fair to you. And we as a group have to be very, very careful who we spend our money with. The African-American community is worth many trillions of dollars. Many trillions. And the thing is, is we have to be very careful how we spend our money. If we see businesses that don't want to support us and don't want to treat us fairly, don't spend your money with them. Under no circumstances, cut them off. 
And I have to say that that hasn't changed 55 minutes past the hour. And I'm, you're right about that. I mean, we could go on for hours with this conversation. Carl, I, I know that you were very much involved back in the day when we were fighting for the uh, the King uh, celebration. And now we have this. I know that uh, uh, very often uh, when we were trying to get Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, uh, birthday a holiday, uh, we brought in people like Stevie Wonder and places like Arizona with the last in the country to, to support that, that effort. And when you see what's going on with Juneteenth today, uh, and with respect to what uh, Reggie just brought up in terms of the revenue stream, are you hopeful? Are you optimistic that things will change? Uh, we, we, we have to be optimistic. And, and we have to stay in the game and we have to stay in, in the fight. Uh, we, we, we have seen uh, an awakening to some degree and racial reckoning that is around and has to be acknowledge and we have to be a part of that we have seen issue issues like reparation uh, that are coming up the issue that uh, when you know way back in the days we were on LIB talking these um, talk we're seeing that in a, in a way that is coming to some realization even here and it's a, to a large extent being pushed in the Caribbean um, region so we have to be optimistic that our our people will be awakened. They'll, they'll, they'll come to see uh, what we're dealing with. We are also hopeful that the major corporation will understand that their focus can't be just on their bottom line and on their shareholders. That can't last forever and have such a wide disparity between their interests and those of black and brown people, not only in the United States, but globally. So we have to be um, very optimistic. And of course, the Black Lives Matter movement has uh, brought a consciousness that we are all engaged and involved in. So to answer your question, I'm hopeful. And uh, I, I think it's people like you and I and Reggie, we, we, we need to keep the drum beat. Uh, Reggie talks about uh, sneakers and uh, you know black people not only purchasing, but set, setting the trend. And we have our outstanding athletes um, endorsing these sneakers. But not a dime is coming into black media. Black media that made black entertainers and black sports people, we, we, we gave them the exposure when they were struggling. When they, and when they make it and they have this big endorsement, not one turn back to look at black media that gave them their first exposure that put them on the map. And, um, and so we have to raise that consciousness to with um, entertainers and sports people that you, you you are part of a community that is still struggling. And in fact, were it not for early exposure and, and the black media and black um, support, and even black support in their career and uh, today, they wouldn't be where they were, but they endorse these sneaker um, brands they do uh, all of these a great thing and they make billions of dollars but never look back at not only black media but black businesses in general and black business within the community that they're from so we have that and we have to stay with it we'll have to to continue to raise the issue when because if we don't we're talking about losing our voice and, about and i hate you. And I hate to cut you off, but we are virtually out of time, gentlemen. I want to thank you very much. And such short notice to be a participant in this week's edition. We will both have you back, and we will certainly set up uh, if quickly, Carl, to, to reach you, anyone who's watching uh, the program this afternoon. What, uh, what's the best way? Uh, NYCaribNews.com. That's our website for Carib News. And, um, uh, and we... Our uh, email address, all the contact information is there, nycaribnews.com. And Reggie? Uh, ReggieT58 at gmail.com. Very good. Thank you very much. That wraps and ties this edition of the Urban Algorithm for this week. We'll be back next week with more. Thank you. 